there was a farmer who for years had plowed around a large rock in his field. Now he had broken one cultivator and two plowshares by hitting it. Each time he approached the rock, he fretted about how much cropland he was losing around it and the damage that that rock had done. One day, he decided he had enough and he dug up that rock. I'm going to do it. I'm going to dig this thing up. He takes his wagon over there. He puts a large crowbar under one side and he found to his surprise and probably dismay that the rock was less than a foot thick. It was long. It looked wide. It's only a foot thick. All this time he was worrying. He was fretting about this problem that he had. Now what to do with it? He started thinking about it. He said, now here this thing was a problem for so long, but you know what? This rock is going to end up being a solution. And the reason he had that thought is because he remembered his barn. In the back of the barn, there was a door. And he had to jump up to get into that door in the back of his barn. So he took that rock and he turned it into a step. And that's what he did with it. So he was able to get up, up and in and out of his barn. So he took something that was a problem for so long and then turned it into a solution. Well, how about our problems? And we have plenty of them, don't we? Think of some of the problems that you're facing right now. I want you to just go ahead and take a second. Think of the problems that you're dealing with. It could be health, physical, emotional, old age, discouragement, depression. Maybe it's our job, family. Whatever it is, we're all dealing with problems. Now, let me ask you this. Do you think that this problem that you feel is a stumbling block, that you're fretting over, do you think it's possible to be turned into a solution? The one that you have in your mind right now. Is that possible? No. You're thinking, no way. There is no way the problem I'm considering could be turned into a stepping stone. It's definitely a stumbling block. Well, we're here to tell you tonight that it can be a stepping stone. Our problems can be a problem-solving opportunity. Now, you may be sitting there thinking, no, I, I, don't st I still don't see how that's the case. Well, after tonight's discourse, you're going to have a total turnaround in mind and thought. Well, how can we do that? Well, think back to the farmer. Remember, one day he decided... It was his choice. It boiled down to his attitude. And it's the same thing with us. When it comes to our problems, we make choices on how we deal with them. We make choices on how to cope with our problems. The problems we face will either defeat us or develop us, depending on how we respond to them. And unfortunately, we fail to see how sometimes Jehovah may allow some problems for the good in our lives. Jehovah would allow my problem, the one that I have in my mind, He would allow that for the good in my life? Yes. We're going to give you five reasons. Five reasons Jehovah may allow a certain problem or problems in our life. Number one. Jehovah may allow some problems to help direct us. Direct us. What do we mean by that? Well, sometimes a fire must be lit under us to get us moving. Would you agree? I'll give you an example. That My dad was diagnosed with emphysema. And he smoked two packs of cigarettes all his life. And we said, Dad, you can't smoke two packs of cigarettes. It's, it's going to kill you. And uh, he said, no, 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 no. I know what I'm doing. You know, hey, George Burns smoked all his life. He was lived to be 100. You know, it was always the rare exception, they quote. Dad, you can't do it. So now that he has diagnosed with emphysema, the doctor said, listen, there's no cure for emphysema, but we can prolong your life if you stop smoking right now. So guess what he allowed this problem to do? He allowed it to redirect them. Now he stopped smoking. But isn't it sad it had to take some kind of tragedy like that, a fire, we have to have a fire underneath us to make us change. And Jehovah may allow problems in our life. So we redirect the way we're doing it. We keep doing what we're doing. We keep getting what we're getting. 
Kind of like this. Ow, I hate that. It really hurts when I do that. And you know what? By the end of, if I keep doing this, by the end of the night, I ain't going to be able to lift my arm up. I can't drive. It's going to be a whole... Yeah. Stop doing it. <laughs> Stop doing what you're doing. If your problem is something, maybe you're causing your own problem. Let it redirect you. Stop it. Problems often point us in a new direction and motivate us to change. Is Jehovah trying to get your attention? And sometimes it takes a painful situation to make us change our ways. Now notice what Jehovah tells us in Proverbs. Go to Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 30. Notice how Jehovah helps us, how we're helped to redirect ourselves here. Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 30. Now as we go through these five solutions, or five problem-solving opportunities, I want you to keep considering your personal problem, what you're personally dealing with, and see if we can pick one or two of these to help you turn your problem into a solution. So look at Proverbs chapter 20 and verse 30. Here's what Jehovah tells us. He says, bruising wounds, difficult problems, ones that hurt, ones that bruise, Bruising wounds are what scours away the bad. Yeah, see that? Things are problems, difficult problems. See, they hurt us. They can scour away the bad. It says, and strokes. That doesn't sound pleasant, does it? Strokes. It hurts. Strokes. The innermost parts of the belly. Yes, strokes can help us to make internal changes, deep internal changes. A Canadian neurosurgeon did a test and he said his experiment came to the conclusion that the same brain chemistry that takes place in your mind when you're being physically tortured is the same brain chemistry that goes on in your mind when you have to change a habit. That's why habits are hard to break. That's why it's so difficult. Take a diet for example. It's difficult, isn't it? You've been eating Twinkies for, you know, 40 years, and all of a sudden you're going to change your Twinkies into carrot sticks. Is that easy? <laughs> what do you think? It's good for like the first three days. You go on a diet, you buy all that meat and cheese, you know. And the fourth day, do you want to see another piece of meat? You've had it. See, for us to change a habit, or the way we live, or the way we think about something, to adjust our thinking, is like physical tor- It's very, very difficult. But see, we can, Jehovah will allow a problem to direct us so the innermost parts of the belly, internal changes, deep changes can take place. Now let's give you some examples of that. Let's talk about marital problems. As a traveling brothers, we have to deal with marital problems at times. I was in a situation where uh, young couples having marital problems. And so I was... Uh, at this point, I was just a brand new elder in the congregation, and one of the older brothers said, why don't you go with me? And I was newly married. I'm like, I don't know, nothing, nothing. He goes, well, just sit and listen. It might help you, too. Right. <laughs> I don't know. Heather might have been talking to him. I don't know. What you I said, okay, let's go. This is good. So we go, and uh, so he goes, and he talks to the, the young couple, and he says, what seems to be the problem? She goes, well, I'll tell you the problem. It's him. She goes, he doesn't take the lead. If he took the lead like the Bible says he's supposed to take the lead, then we wouldn't have this problem. She bats it over to him. The ping pong ball goes on his side of the table. He takes a swing at it and he says, the problem is you. He says, you're not submissive. I don't want to take the lead with somebody that's not submissive. And the Bible says you're to do that. Ping pong ball goes back to her and she goes, I'll tell you what about you. And the brother goes, hey, hold on a second. And now this is where it gets interesting. He says, let me ask you this question. He says, was there ever a time when you, like, liked each other? I'm like, this is getting good. Y'all are kind of, like, checking this. I'm like, yeah. And, uh, like, he's stirring up the pot a little bit. And he, she says, uh, she goes, well, of course. He goes, I mean, when did you, when were you just, like, in love? When did you look at him and you saw those little hearts popping around the top of his head? And when, Tell me that time. And she says, well, when we were dating, we were courting. He goes, why? He goes, oh, 
He'd come over and spend hours, and he'd listen to me. I would talk about whatever, and he was just, he was all ears. He'd just listen and said, oh, that's so interesting. And, and she goes, you know, there are times that he would just hold my hand for no reason. He buy me candy. He bought me flowers. He told me he loved me. And she goes, he just looking in, his, in my eyes, those dreamy eyes of his. Oh, I just remember those times. It was so wonderful. <laughs> I'm like, hmm. And then, uh, and he looks at him. He goes, well, would you agree with that? When you were dating, did you have that warm, fuzzy feeling of being in love? He goes, well, of course. Because I would do something for her, then she would do something for me, then I would do something for her, and then she and we just wanted to do stuff for each other, and it just built up. It was just it was fantastic. Fell in love, and we got married. He says, "So do you do those things now? Do you ever hold just hold her hand? No. Do you ever just listen to her, listen to each other, communicate? No. We fight." Here's what he said. Now, this is profound. He says, the reason you had the warm, fuzzy feeling with the hearts, he says, the reason you had that, because you were doing the acts of love. He said, love is a noun, but love is a verb. It's an action word. And you were doing the action of love, and when you do love, you get the warm, fuzzy feeling of love. You stop doing the acts of love, so you lost the warm, fuzzy feeling. You want the warm, fuzzy feeling again? You want that feeling again? Yeah. Then go back to doing the acts of love. You listen. You communicate. You hold her hand. You go buy her something. You go do something for her. And you do something for him. And if you go back to doing the act of love, you will get the feeling back. Isn't that good counsel? He said, let this problem that you're dealing with as a family, he said, let it redirect you. Stop doing what you're doing or you're going to keep having a problem. It's going to get worse and worse. Let it redirect you. Let it move you to a different direction and go back and do the acts of love. Wasn't that fantastic counsel? He looked at me, he's like, like you too. He didn't say it. <laughs> I do the acts of love, huh? There. Okay. <laughs> okay. Same thing with our children. So with our children, we're having problems with our children. It becomes a problem. It's an obstacle. It's something that stresses us out. It's things that we worry about. So if we keep doing what we're doing, we keep getting what we're getting. So, so for example, we have problems with our children. I ask parents, are you having a regular family study with them? No, it's just so difficult. We've got so many things going. But if you keep doing that, you're going to keep getting rebellion. You're going to keep getting problems with your children. You've got to stop what you're doing and take the time to do it. There's no other answer for it. It's time, communication, it's effort. We can't have other people raise our children. We have to raise our We have to spend the time. Why well, don't have time? We have to make time. You had them. You had them. Of course, we all try to help you and encourage you, but if you're having problems with your children, then you, at some point you have to say, okay, what am I doing? Because I'm, I'm not successful. There's got to be something that I'm, I'm doing wrong. I gotta, there's something that I'm having this problem. I need to redirect the way I'm doing it. Just don't keep going through the same pattern. Get some help. Ask for some advice. Get some counsel. Now, I'm not a parent, so I don't know, but I've been a kid before. And what I'll do is I go through the congregations, I'll ask parents. And what I do is I look for successful parents. And I just, what I'll do is I'll, I'll just key in on them. I'll say, how do you do it? What is it that you're doing? So I can gather the information so as I do the work, you know, I can share it with others. I go, what is it that you're doing? And I'm telling you, every single parent that I've ever talked to that are successful, you know what they tell me? They're strict. They're strict. Strict parents are successful. They know where their children are. They have a regular family study. They go out in service. Spiritual things are put first. It's just a fact. It's not a question. If you go out in service, you just go out in service. That's what you do. You have a family study. They all know where their kids are. They watch their association. They spend time with them. That's what they do. There's no magic formula. It's just following the Bible's advice. So if we're not strict with them, if we're not firm with them, then we get what we get. So we need to reevaluate maybe the way we're training our children if we're having problems with them. We need to look at the counsel from God's Word and see what He tells us. For example, Proverbs chapter 29, verse 21 says not to spoil or pamper our, pamper our children. If we pamper our children, it says, and easily give in to their wishes, later in life, that scripture says, they will become thankless. 
So we spoil them, we pamper them, everything's cute, and we don't discipline them, we don't discipline them. And all of a sudden, as they grow up and they become teenagers, they say, I want to do this, and then we're shocked. Well, I, I don't know what happened to them. But you never disciplined them when they were little. And so as a result, you know what? They're thankless. They're like, you've never told me no before. Now all of a sudden, I'm in my teenage years, and I want to stay out to 2 in the morning, and now you're telling me no. And that is unreasonable to them. And they're accurate. Because you've never disciplined them as when they were little. You never gave them tight boundaries. But see, when they become teenagers, we all want to put the, the, the heat down. And they're like, hey, they become thankless. And they go through life, and even as adults, we become thankless ones because of the way we were trained. No discipline. Jehovah says, discipline and train your children. So if we're having a problem that way, reevaluate the way we're doing things and do things Jehovah's way. How about this one? How about if we're having a problem with a brother or sister in the congregation? Maybe we're, somebody upset us. Well, how does Jehovah allow that problem to direct us? Well, he directs us in two ways when we're having a problem with a brother and sister. You know what Jehovah tells us? Two things. Forgive and forget. That's one option. Option number two is go talk with them and work it out and pursue peace. You don't want to pursue peace and talk with them? Guess what your second option is? Forgive and forget. But you don't want to forgive and forget it? Talk to them and work it out. I don't want to talk to him and work it out. Then your next option is pursue peace. Forgive and forget. You don't want to forgive and forget? Pursue peace and work it out. Well, I don't want to work it out. Then you have to forgive and forget. But I don't want to forgive and forget. Let's see. Let's, let me look at all my options. Option. Oh, i got to go talk to them and work it out and pursue peace. Well, I don't want to go work it out and pursue peace. So what do I do? you got to forgive and forget. But it's hard to forgive and forget. Then you got to go talk to them and work it out with them. Well, I don't want to talk and work it out with them. Then you have to forgive and forget. You get it? There's no option three. You know what option three is that we throw in there? It's, I don't know. It's not in here. I don't know where we get. Option three is to talk about it with everybody else. And stir it up or hold a grudge. There's no option. There's no scriptural. Op there's no option for that. Forgive and forget. Pursue peace. That's it. That's all we can do. Those are your options. So if we're having problems with the brothers and sisters and it doesn't seem to be working out, do I have to say them again? Okay. Very good. How about this one? People don't invite me over. That's a problem. Congregation's kind of cold. I never get invited. Hmm. Well, if that's our problem, let it redirect us. Well, there's a couple options we have. One is that we can start inviting others, and we can be a source of encouragement, and we can build relationships with others. Or another option is, here's the one we don't like, but maybe we need to be more likable. <laughs> Honestly, I mean, I, I, I mean, maybe you're just not likable. Oh, that's me. No, it's just... I mean, if we're negative or we're complaining, who wants to have somebody like that over? It's just it's a nervous situation, so we just have a, so if that's the case with us, I'm not saying that that is the case, but we just have to examine ourselves and say, because there's other people that get invited all the time. Now, why is that? Does that make sense? So we just have to, we have to look at ourselves, examine ourselves, say, why is Jehovah allowing this problem? Instead of stewing over it and complaining about, it, let's let it redirect us. Say, you know what? I'm going to do something about it. And so we need to be solution-oriented. Now, this is a life lesson my stepfather gave me. I had a problem, and I was in high school, and um, it's my stepfather. My mom says to me, uh, why don't you talk to your stepfather about your problem? And I'm like, ugh. I didn't talk to him. You know, he don't even know me. What's he going to say to me? Just, just, just try it. So I said, listen, I have this problem, and because I don't want to hear it. I'm like, yeah, figures, you know, you don't hear it. <laughs> He goes, no, he goes, I don't want to hear it right now. He goes, here's what I want you to do. He goes, here's how I deal with problems. He goes, I would like you to go in your room, and I want like you to come up with two options, two solutions for your problem. 
Think of your problem, and then I don't, you have to write it down or in your mind, whatever you want to do. But I want you to come up with two solutions, two options. And when you get done with those two solutions, you come back to me. We'll discuss your problem, and then I'm going to help you to pick the best solution out of the two. Because that's how we deal with problems. That's how I deal with them. Never done that before. And so I did that. And you know what? It hurt to do that. It, it's hard. It was very hard. Because you know what we like to do with our problems? What do we like to do? We like to bask in them. We like to commiserate. We just want to complain. Oh, i tell you what happened. And this. And we just like to talk about it and vent about it. And then complain about it. Isn't that how we are? Honestly. It makes us feel good just to vent about our problems. And my dad was like, I don't want to hear it. I don't want to hear. He goes, you have to start thinking in solutions, not in problems. That will not, so all it's going to do is aggravate you. And I tell you what, that was one of the best life lessons I ever received. It teaches you to think differently. Instead of commiserating the problem, think of solutions. And I tell you what, that's, it's been a wonderful life lesson. Try it. I challenge you to do it for a week. I'm telling you, it will hurt your brain. Because you just want to talk about it. You want know, to dig in there. And just, yeah. I actually got to do something about it. Ugh. So it's, it's miserable. I'm telling you, it's a different way of thinking. Try it. I challenge you for one week when you have a problem, instead of venting, just analyze the problem and then come up with two options and then pick the best solution. I'm telling you, it's very difficult to do. Try it. If you do it, if you can do that life lesson, it will change your life. It will change the way you handle things. It will help you to be a better able to cope and deal with problems. Try it. Number two. Jehovah may allow some problems to help inspect us. We had direct us, now we have inspect us. Now, why would Jehovah allow some problem to inspect me? What does that mean? Well, people are like tea bags. If you want to know what's inside them, just drop them in hot water. Right? So that's what it is with us. See, so we feel like maybe we're spiritually inclined and we're mature, mature. We, have, we, we view ourselves a certain way. Now, all of a sudden, a problem comes up upon us, and it really shows what's inside of us. Regardless of how we like to view ourselves, it shows if we're spiritually mature people, if we're, if we're people that want to do things Jehovah's way. For example, what do your problems reveal about you? Go back to the problem that you are thinking of earlier. The way I'm dealing with this problem, how, what does this say about me as a spiritual person? Am I dealing with it Jehovah's way? Or am I dealing with it in a physical way, maybe... Shows what we are. Now notice what Jehovah tells us. Look at James chapter 1. James chapter 1 in verse 2. James chapter 1 in verse 2. Very interesting comment made here by James. James chapter 1 in verse 2. I'm going to read verses 2 through 4. So there in verse 2 it says, Consider it all joy. Consider it all all joy. What, what, what's he mean by that? Well, he explains it. He says, Consider it all joy, my brothers, when you meet with various trials. When you meet with problems. Sickness, temptation, persecutions, whatever it is, our trial or our problem, James says, Consider it, all of it, a joy. Does that make any sense? Let me get this straight. You're saying that I'm supposed to take my problem and be joyful about it. No. My problem is not joyful. It's painful. It hurts. Now why would James say that? Well, look at verse 3. He says, Knowing as you do, that this tested quality of your faith works out endurance. You see, when we endure a problem, we prove our faith. It becomes one of tested quality. Our faith is made stronger through trials. It will help us to endure future tests. And in verse 4 it says, but let endurance have its work complete. You notice that? He's saying, let your problem work all the way out to the end. Don't even try to stop your problem. Because it's going to let it work all the way to its completion. And notice why. He says, that you may be complete and sound in all respects, not lacking in anything. James says, if you endure your problem, 
that you're going to show yourself to be complete. You're going to show yourself that you will serve Jehovah regardless of what you face. Does that make sense? So if we have a problem, we consider it a joy because I can prove the devil a liar by the way I react to my problem. See, the devil says, well, you'll, you give this person, a, what do he say to Job? You put some pressure on him. Oh, they only serve you because you only do good things for him. You put some pressure on Job, he will, he will just fold in half. And he's saying the same thing about us. Yeah, you put some pressure on these people, they'll stop coming to the meetings. They'll stop studying the Bible. They'll stop going out in service. Yeah, they'll start talking negative. That's what the you go ahead and put some pressure on them. You know what Jehovah says? Uh uh. You put pressure on my people and they're loyal. They love me. They'll serve me no matter what you do. You could put whatever pressure you want on my people and they love me, they're loyal, they'll stick through through me through thick and thin. Doesn't matter. And so we should welcome problems with that type of spiritual thinking. Does that make sense? So go ahead, give, give me some problems. Because every time I get with a problem and I endure the problem, I prove the devil a liar. I mean, I can actually prove my faith to Jehovah. I can show him how much I love him. Yeah, endure the problem. And let it, let it work out complete, and then you're not going to be lacking in anything. Give me another problem. Go ahead, devil, give me another problem. I'm going to show you a liar. Yeah, this is good. feels good. I'm going to endure it. I don't care. Give it to me. It comes down to the old saying, when, when do you want to know that you have a hole in your boat? At the dock? Or out in the middle of the ocean? Yeah, you want to know you have it at the dock. You want to know where we're weak. I want, I want Jehovah to inspect me when I have my problems. Say, Jehovah, where, am, where do I have a weak spot? So maybe it's dealing with a death in the family. Maybe it's dealing with persecution. Maybe it's dealing with an own, my own personal weakness. And if I'm folding spiritually, I'm showing myself to have a hole. I've got to patch it up. I've got to patch it up. Because very soon, I'm going to have to run with horses. I've got the Great Tribulation coming. Now's not the time. I mean, if I can't make it now, how about when the Great Tribulation comes and we're truly tested? I want to know right now where my weak spots are. So I consider it a joy to endure and patch my boat. Now how can we show that? What are some areas that that can be the case with us? Well, let's just talk about sickness. There's three F's. The three F's for missing a meeting. You know what they are? Fracture, fever, funeral. That's it. So if we can't be here physically, can we listen in by phone? Some of our friends are, are listening by phone. But see, they want to get the meeting. This is Jehovah's arrangement. We can listen to the tapes. We have somebody tape the meeting. How about if we have financial troubles? Are we going to work more? Are we going to trust in Jehovah? Trust in ourselves or trust in Jehovah? See, the heat's on us. What are we going to show? What's going to reveal about us? We say we trust in Jehovah. We've read the scripture. We may even gave a talk on it. Matthew 6.33, put, put kingdom interest first. That's right, that's what we need. We just put Jehovah first and he'll provide everything else. All of a sudden, we get some heat. See, we get some pressure, maybe financially. What are we going to do? Are we going to apply Matthew 6.33? Are we going to count on ourselves? We show what we are. How about this one? How about receiving counsel? That's hard. That's not an easy one, is it? We receive counsel. As a matter of fact, probably, as a new circuit overseer, that's probably been my biggest eye-opener, I'll just be honest with you, in two and a half years, is, is how people receive counsel. It's shocking. And of course, it makes me think about myself. You know, how do I receive counsel? It's hard for the friends to accept counsel. He's so direct. Oh, oh can you do that? Yeah, Jehovah's direct. Jehovah's very direct with us. You know why Jehovah's direct with us? Because he loves us. Jehovah loves us. He wants us to do better. He's not trying to hurt us. I mean, I'm not naive. I know people talk. Well, he's new. He's young. He's kind of direct. I don't know. I'm just... You know. These outlines are from Jehovah. Don't kill the messenger. 
It's like, well, I don't want to change. I don't like that count. So it pinches a little bit. And I don't want to say the faith on discrete slave is out of line or the Bible. Let's see, who's left? It ain't me. It ain't them. It's me. <laughs> or it's the elders. And you know what we do when we get counsel? We recriminate. You know what it means to recriminate? We start picking on the person. See, the counsel pinches. Remember, it's like physical torture to change our thinking or to accept. It's very difficult at times if we're not humble. And so what we, the natural thing to do is just pick on the person giving the counsel. Well, they're not so shit. Randy Larson ain't perfect. I can tell you that right now. And that's what we do. And, we'll, and you know, and we'll, instead of just taking it, Jehovah loves us. He wa- we're, we're supposed to look for counsel. Look for counsel so we can be perfected, right? So we can not lack in anything. And yet, sometimes we receive counsel, and I see the fr- they complain. Friends complain. They talk. They stop coming to the meetings. Talk to those who are inactive. Talk to a sister one time who's inactive, and I said, what's wrong? She goes, the brothers. Brothers are mean. Never shepherded me. Never, never took care of me, ever. I said, I don't, I don't, honestly don't, I can't even comprehend it. Honestly, I can't. I'm, if you can explain to me later, maybe, I, I don't get that. It's between you and Jehovah. It has nothing, to, I don't care what you do. I, who can do, how can you be stumbled? If you love Jehovah's law, you can't be stumbled. Psalm 119. You can't. Almost can't. <laughs> I'm stumbled. No. So, if we think that we're not going to serve Jehovah... Because somebody said something. Now, how silly is that? You're going to give up everlasting life because somebody said something to you that wasn't right. Or something he did something. And yet we do the same thing. We sin all the time. We say stupid things. We do dumb things. But isn't that funny how we are? Well, they just didn't love us. They didn't show us enough love. And so I'm, just, I'm stumbled. So I'm not going to come. You're going to give up your life for that. And you will give up your life for that. If you know what's right and you don't do it, it's a sin for any one of us. Our relationship, the contract was between us and Jehovah. So when we're standing at Judgment Day, and Jesus Christ is going to ask us why we weren't preaching the good news, and why we weren't doing what we're supposed to, and we pull out our get-out-of-death-free card, well, here's our card. I was stumbled. Yeah, Brother Fearing is really, I don't know if you know him, but very direct, very mean. And uh, Randy Larson, and Randy Larson was mean. And uh, here's my card. So that's why I was stumbled. That's why I didn't do anything to serve you. You know what Christ is going to do? You know what? It wasn't about Ed Ferriance. It wasn't about Randy Larson. You know who it was about? It was between you and I. That was the contract. You said you would serve me through thick and thin. You said you'd be loyal, that you would serve me. There's no stumbling block for those loving God's law. Step to the left. So let our problems inspect us. Now here's another thing. Under love in the insight book. Here's what it mentions. It says, if another person is properly corrected by one having authority, the loving person will not sentimentally side with the chastised one and find fault with the correction or the authorized one who did the correcting. Such an action would not be an expression of love for the individual. It might gain the favor of the corrected one, but would harm rather than help him. So somebody gets counsel, somebody gets correction, and we're like, well, they just missed, yeah, well, they are mean because you're so sweet. I can't believe they counseled you. You, come here, it's okay. The mean brothers are mean to you. You're hurting them. You know what? You're killing them. Let them accept the discipline. And if they get counseled, say, you know what, you know, brother, I love you. Like my brother, you know, my brother, just take the counsel. It's good for you. Don't side. How would you like if I did that with your children? Hmm? Do you discipline your children? I come over and go, your mommy's so mean. She is a mean mommy. I noticed that as a circuit overseer. I don't even like her. Come here. It's okay. You can run in the kingdom hall. You weren't even hardly running. What would you do? Not good. You wouldn't appreciate that, right? Be careful of that. We can become enablers. An enabler is one who enables another to persist in self-destructive behavior by providing excuses. 
We can enable another one. We can enable them to lose their life, to reject counsel, because we want to win them over and side with them when they complain to us. Instead, the loving, kind thing to do is, brother, take the counsel. Number three. Number three is, Jehovah may allow some problems to help correct us. Correct us. We had direct, we had protect, or inspect, and now we have correct. Some lessons we learn only through pain and failure. It's likely that as a child, your parents told you not to touch a hot stove. Right? And what did you do? What did you do? What did you do? Bethany, what would you do? <laughs> we touch it. I don't know, boys especially. I remember we had a hot, uh, we had an electrical stove so it turned orange. So it was kind of neat, you know. And uh, my mom says, never, ever touch that stove. Don't touch it. You're going to hurt you. It's hot, burn, bad, you know, all those things. And my brother, he's kind of slick. What he would do, he would, he would wet his finger and then he'd touch it. It didn't hurt me. <laughs> but I never see him wet his finger. I'm like... She said, you bur- he didn't get burned. Uh, yeah. <laughs> you just do it. Stupid. See? <laughs> you just, sometimes we just got to feel the pain. So sometimes we learn only the value of something, health, money, or relationship, when we lose it. Now notice the 119th Psalm. Notice how Jehovah will allow this problem to help correct us. The 119th Psalm, verse 71. 119th Psalm and ver- verse 71. So maybe this applies to your personal problem. There it says, It is good for me. It is good for me. What's good for me? It says, It's good for me that I have been afflicted. Yes, it's good for us that we have a problem. Now, how could it be good for me that I've been afflicted or dealing with a problem or a trial? It says, in order that I may learn your regulations. Yes, Jehovah says, I'm going to allow this problem so it corrects you. Verse 72 says, the law of your mouth is good for me, more so than thousands of pieces of gold and silver. Now, how could this be the case in a practical way? Well, let's, how about this? How about if we've lost some privileges in the congregation? We're no longer an elder, or we're no longer a ministerial servant, or we're no longer a pioneer. And that can be a problem, because you know what? That hurts. Because we want to do more. We want to reach out and do something for Jehovah, the best of our ability. And if we lost one of those privileges, we have to say to ourselves, how can that problem be something positive? How can I allow that problem to correct me? Well, I could sulk about it, and I could complain about it, and I can recriminate, and I could be upset. Or you know what? I could take the counsel and apply God's word and do something differently. The way I handled it perhaps wasn't correct. And so I want to let this, this discipline correct me so when I do serve again as a ministerial servant, an elder, a pioneer, I do it the right way. I do it Jehovah's way this time. You see how that can be a positive thing? And yet it does hurt, but Jehovah may allow it to get our attention. Remember, Jehovah loves those whom he disciplines. And if we're not getting corrected, what does that tell you? Let me say that again. Jehovah loves those whom he disciplines. So if you're not getting disciplined or corrected, what does that tell you? Jehovah doesn't love me? That's what he says. He loves those whom he disciplines. So what should that tell you when it comes to discipline? We should look for discipline. Now here's often a case where we're tested. And it, it comes out when, we're, when we have a dis, this fellowship family member. A son or a daughter or a mother or a father or a grandparent or a cousin or whatever it is or a close friend. When they have been disfellowshipped from the Christian congregation according to the scriptures, do we completely cut them off as Jehovah tells us to do? Are we allowing Jehovah to correct them? Disfellowshipping is a loving arrangement from Jehovah. It's an act of love. It's, 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 he, Jehovah's willing to cut someone off, to shock them to their senses, to get their attention so they correct themselves and come back to serving Him. Protects the congregation as well. And if we're not allowing Jehovah's discipline to take place, then we are hurting the person. 
And if we are associating with disfellowship family members, we have to answer to God. We have to answer to Jehovah. Because you know what Jehovah says? Jehovah says no. He says no. The 91 Watchtower, April 15th, page 22. It says, Former friends and relatives might hope that a disfellowship one would return, yet out of respect for the command at 1 Corinthians chapter 5 and verse 11, they do not associate with an expelled person. That scripture says to quit mixing in company with anyone. It doesn't matter if it's a son or daughter or mother or father. With anyone called a brother that is a fornicator, a greedy person, not even eating with such a man. And John, it says, not even say a greeting. You wouldn't even say a simple hello. The 88 Watchtower, April 15th, says it might be possible to have almost no contact at all with a relative. There are necessary family matters that you would have to. Necessary, mandatory. Other than that, no. Jehovah says no. That's mean. Hmm. Okay. Let's play this one out. Your child, you give them some counsel. They don't respond. You love them, so you got to discipline them. So you discipline them again. They don't respond. You discipline them again. They don't respond. What do you do? Eventually, you discipline them. Either corporal punishment is what I always got. It's the days of timeouts now. I wish... I was, I was born too early. <laughs> and so now, I mean, there are times where, and I did get sent to my room, so what we do is we give them a time out, or we send them to their room. Now, we will do that in order to get their attention, because why? We're trying to discipline them so they act right, and we're trying to save their life in the long run, right? So you give your son or daughter a time out. Now, when you give them a time out, what is their mental state? Because here's what happens. When, when sons and daughters get disfellowship with their family, they're like, well, you know what, brother? They're, they're really, you know, they're just going, they're just emotionally not handling it very well. So I just got to be there with them. Well, that's what happens when the people get disciplined, right? When you send your son or daughter to their room, or they just like, okay, thanks a lot, mom. See you in the room. Be back in a little bit. <laughs> I got everything under control. Gotcha. Is that what they do? They go nuts. I hate you, I hate you, I'm going to kill myself. <laughs> Am I right? That's what they do. They're not stable. They're never, I, mean, you, I was never stable. I'm still not stable. Normally I'm not stable. You imagine getting disciplined? I went nuts. And so our son or daughter gets this fellowship and we're like, oh, well they're not stable, so we got to help. They're not supposed to be stable. They got disciplined. So you send your son or daughter to their time out in their room and all of a sudden now, uh, the next door neighbor comes over. Can I play with Johnny? Yeah, sure, go ahead. He's, he's getting disciplined in his room. Yeah, just, here's a video game, box of video games. Yeah, just go in there and have a good time with him. Is that discipline? Or if your brother and sister wants to go in there and play with him, you say, hey, get out of the room. You want him to sit in that room by himself and think about what he's done. When people get this fellowship, they get a time out. You can't associate with them. You can't talk with them. You can't baby them. You can't pamper them. They don't learn. And you are responsible for it. As long as you know that. You are responsible before Jehovah if you associate with your disfellowship family members. You have to answer to God for that. You could hurt them. Because they get the best of both lives. They live a debauched life. They get to do what they want. And then guess what? They, you get to associate with them. You know what it's called? It's called tough love. It's called tough love. I remember my mom sent me to my room one time. I go, yeah, I'm going to run away from home. She goes, what would you say? I was like, oh. She didn't play. You, know, she didn't, you just didn't say stuff like that. So she says, did you just say you're going to run? She goes, come here. She takes me up to my room. She packs my bags, and she throws me outside. She shuts the door. I was like, eight or nine. I'm not kidding you. And I have my little suitcase there. You know, it's scared a little bit. You're scared because you're like, I can't believe she threw you know, I mean, She packed my stuff, and she goes, you're out of here big talker, you know. So I get out there, and you know, I get down the other driveway, and I'm, I'm looking down that way. Highway's that way. Can't go that far. She said not to go to the highway. Can't go. <laughs> Look down that way. Nothing that way. You know what? Hey, I cried. I sat on the door. I sat right there on the porch and cried. And it was hours. I mean, it wasn't just like, hey, a little lesson. I sat there and cried. And I knock on the door. And you know what she tells me this day when we talk, my mom and I talk? 
She says to me, she goes, you know what? While you were crying outside, I was in the house crying. She goes, it was hard. She goes, but you know what? You had to learn. And she goes, you never did it again. You never did it again. I'm a little, you know, got a little issue. I've got some issues about it, but I never did it again. And I love my mom for it. I mean, I call my mom all, I love my mom. And she was a disciplinarian. She loved me. And she wanted me to, to do the best. Like she, she looked long term for me. So that's what's happening with those who are disfellowship. Luke chapter 15 and verse 14. When it talks about the prodigal son. We just don't have time to go there. But take a note of this. Luke chapter 15 verse 14. It says the debauched son who's living a debauched life. It says he started to be in need. That's what verse 14 says. He started to be in need. Verse 16 says... Now imagine this. Here's a son living a debauched life, leaves his father, he starts to be in need. And in verse 16 it says, And no one, no one would give him anything. So here's this father's son. In this case, let's make the illustration that he's a disfellowshipped. And he starts to be in need. It says no one would give him anything. As a matter of fact, the son was desiring to eat the food that the pigs were given. That's how desperate he was. He was that desperate. You didn't see his father go, oh, he's so desperate. Oh, i got to help him. He didn't go out there and help. It says no one would give him anything. And you know what the result of that was? The very next verse, you know what it says? It says, he came to his senses. He came to his senses. Now, why did he come to his senses? Let's just reason this out. Why did he come to his senses? You know why? Because he was desperate. He didn't, nobody would give him anything. He's like, you got to be kidding me. My father's servants are eating bread and I'm des- desiring to eat pig food. I don't have anything. I am destitute. I, am, I have nothing. And then he came to his senses. So if his dad would have saw him and took care of him and talked to him and, and gave him something, would, would he have came to his senses? No. Tough love. And then, when he came to his senses, then he says, I have sinned against my father. And then, Jehovah took him back. Then Jehovah's mercy was extended when there was something to extend mercy for. It was his actions. And same thing, when they're reinstated, then they've come back to Jehovah. And you know what we do? We just take them in. We just love them because they have been disciplined. Their time out has served its purpose. But until then, stay out of the room. Number four, Jehovah may allow some problems to help protect us. Protect us. So we had direct, we had inspect, we had correct, and now we have protect. A problem can be a blessing in disguise if it prevents us from being harmed by something more serious. Premarital sex, you don't go to the prom, you don't do this, you don't do that. You guys are goody goodies, you don't listen to dirty jokes, you don't... And maybe we have that same problem at work. And that could be a problem because we all want to feel a value. We all want to feel like we belong. And so we go to school and we stand out like a sore thumb or we go to work. It could put pressure on us. Now how can that be a protection? Well, let me give you an example of that. I asked one young brother, I said, how's school going? He goes, pretty good. I said, you having problems? He goes, yeah, I got lots of problems. Like, what are your problems? He goes, oh, I got the girls calling me. I got... Coaches ask me to play sport. I get all, I mean, I just get all kinds of pressure. People ask me to go to their parties and, you know, hang out. And I go, okay. Another brother, same congregation, same school. I go, how's school going? He goes, pretty good. It's not easy. He goes, but I do it. I said, dating. You know, I already heard the one. I go, like, dating. People ask. He goes, no, no, I don't have problems like that. You don't have any problems like that? No. Why does one have problems? I asked him, I said, do you witness at school? He goes, yeah, all the time. He goes, you know, I never used to. And I had so many problems. I had, I had the kids like invite me. He goes, and I just finally said, they kind of knew I was one of Jehovah's Witnesses. They kind of didn't. He goes, I just finally said, you know what? If I'm going to do the truth, I'm just going to do it. So he goes, I start witnessing to him. Well, here's why I don't party. Here's why I don't do drugs. As a matter of fact, the Bible, psh, he said, they're gone. They're gone. He goes, whoa, powerful little thing I got here. Yeah, whoa, watch him run. He goes, yeah, I use the Bible. He goes, you know what, I, I figured it out. He goes, now it's a lonely place. 
at school. I'm eating by myself. He goes, but you know, I realize to be a Christian, we stand out as different. It's not an easy thing. He goes, but it alleviates other problems. What it does, he goes, it becomes a protection for me. So guess what? They never ask me to party. They never do that because they know how I stand. So when I got that, I went back to the other brother. I said, do you witness a school? He goes, eh, not like I should. You know, I try to be real balanced about it. I'm like, yeah, right. How about none? <laughs> See how the problem is a protection for us? Look at Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. I love this. Scripture. This is fantastic. Genesis chapter 50, verse 20. Now this is the case, we're talking about Joseph. Now we all know about Joseph, right? Joseph was sold into slavery by his brothers. He never did anything wrong. I mean, here's, here's a young, young man serving Jehovah. And his brothers take him... So, you talk about problems. How would you like to be sold into slavery? How would you like to go to Walmart with your parents and... Uh, and they sell you to something, they take you to Afghanistan, or, you know. How would you like that? You got some issues now. And then, of course, once he goes into, his, into Egypt and he's sold into slavery, now he becomes uh, Potiphar's wife, addresses him, right? And here he runs from adultery and fornication, and then he gets thrown in jail. Doing some, here he's doing the right thing, and he's got more problems. It's like, oh, he's got all nothing but problems. All he's doing is serving Jehovah. Now here's what happens. This is after Joseph uh, becomes Pharaoh's right-hand man. This is after he makes up with his brothers. Now in Genesis chapter 50, Joseph's father Jacob, he dies. Now Jacob dies, and you know what Joseph's brothers are thinking? They're like, uh-oh. You know, we kind of really messed, we, we really messed up Joseph. And the only reason I think he's been good to us thus far is because dad was alive. Now that dad's dead, I think he's going to stick it to us because he owes us. Here's what Joseph says to his brothers. In verse 20, it says, As for you, you had evil in mind against me. God had it in mind for good. For the purpose of acting as at this day to preserve many people alive. Joseph says, yeah, you know what? You try to do me harm, Jehovah protected me. As a matter of fact, Jehovah allowed me to go through these problems so I can help you. I could save thousands by feeding them through the famine. Jehovah had a game plan. Jehovah had a purpose for allowing Joseph to go through those problems. Now, Joseph didn't know that, did he? He just got one problem after another, trying to do the right thing. He's dealing with all these problems, and Jehovah's allowing it because he was protecting him. Do you see that? So sometimes when we deal with our problems, we just want them fixed right now, but Jehovah gets the big picture. It's kind of like looking through a keyhole. Do you ever like an old house and you have a little keyhole there? Do you ever try to look through a keyhole? Try to see what's going on in the room? I used to spy on my family all the time. I was little. I look at that. I look at a keyhole. See, see, here's my brother. Uh, you, know, you, you only got that much. You know, you look at him like, okay, I see his leg. I see the desk. What's he doing? I can't see. You know, you can't. You just only, you're guessing what's going on in there. And that's the way we look at our problem. With our problems, we're like, oh, 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 oh. And Jehovah sees the whole room. Jehovah looks back and sees the whole thing. And Jehovah's like, no, it's okay. I love you. I will protect you. It's okay. I'm allowing this problem because there's a bigger picture here. I know you can't see it. That's why you have to trust me. I I love you. I gave my son to die for you. I'm not going to hurt you. But I'm telling you, if you endure this problem, good things are going to come around this. I know you don't see it. I know it's hard for you. Trust me. I will not allow you to deal with something that's going to hurt you. Just, it's going to help you. Just just let it protect you. That's what Jehovah's saying. But we just, you know, we're like, oh, because we can only see that much. And Jehovah sees the whole thing. Do you see the point? Number five. Jehovah may allow some problems to help perfect us. Our last one, perfect us. He allowed some problems to direct us, to inspect, to inspect us, to correct us, to protect us, and now to perfect us. Problems, when responded to correctly, are character builders. What is a character builder? Well, character is our makeup. It's what we are. It's who we are. It's what we stand for. It's our emotional. It's our moral qualities that distinguish us as individuals. 
And Jehovah is far more interested in our character than our comfort. Our relationship with Jehovah and our character is the two of the most important things that we have as Christians. We can rejoice when we run into problems. They help us to learn to be patient. Patience develops strength of character. And it helps us to trust in Jehovah more and more each time. Our faith is stronger. Our faith becomes steady because we see that Jehovah takes care of matters. We trust in Him. Romans chapter 5. Let's look at our last scripture here. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. Let's see how Jehovah allows our problems to perfect us. Romans chapter 5 and verse 3. Almost sounds like James. But there's a little twist to it. Notice this. Romans 5 verse 3. It says that not only that, but let us exalt while in tribulations or dealing with problems. Since we know that tribulation produces, there we go, endurance. It says endurance, in turn, an approved condition. Now who approves the condition? We, we have the problem, we endure it, and all of a sudden somebody says to us, I approve of your condition, I approve of that. Who does that? Jehovah. By doing Jehovah's will, by doing what's right, Jehovah approves of our endurance, our approved condition. And because of that, it says the approved condition, in turn, hope. Now we're talking about a personal hope. And then in verse 5 it says, and the hope does not lead to disappointment. Why are we not disappointed when we have hope in Jehovah? It says, because the love of God has been poured out into our hearts. Yes, Jehovah loves us. He takes care of us. He pours out into our hearts. Notice, through the Holy Spirit, which was given us. Yes, Jehovah, through His Holy Spirit, approves of our condition. He gives us hope, and we're never disappointed because of His love for us. He never lets us down, ever. Jehovah always catches us. So we're dealing with this problem, and we endure it, and, and there are some times with our problems, there's nothing we can do. Right? I mean, there is nothing. We want to change it. We can't. We want to do something. We can't. Especially if it's a health problem. or. But you know what we do? We endure it. Jehovah proves it. We put our trust and hope in Him. And every time we do that, He sustains us. He catches us. And, and every time, it strengthens us and we draw closer to Jehovah. Our relationship becomes like that. Like a trusted friend. You ever call somebody that you know, every time I call them, they'll be there for me. You have a trusted friend. Every, every time I'm having a problem, they're there for me. That's Jehovah. And, and it takes an act of faith, because we have to trust in Jehovah. There are times we just have to let it go. We have to let it go and just fall back, and then Jehovah catches us. And then we fall back again, and Jehovah catches us. And then we do it again and again, and then we never have to look back, because we know through experience that Jehovah will catch us. And that's why the old, sometimes we get those who are old, older in the congregation, years of faithful service, you know what? You know why they don't worry about nothing? Because Jehovah's been catching them for years. They just know. And you know, young ones are like, oh no, what's going to happen? And they're like, ah, just trust in Jehovah. And you're thinking, yeah, right. They've been through all kinds of things. And they know Jehovah catches them every time. So they don't worry. The whole place will be falling down around. They're sitting there with their Bible. Just, yeah, Jehovah's got me. It's okay. We're panicking. We're upset. We're going. They're that tight with Jehovah. They, Jehovah has never disappointed them. See, that's through years of trials. And see, we can develop that. We can have that trust in Jehovah. So let me give you a few examples of that. Let's talk about the fear of the theocratic ministry school. I can't do that. I can't do it. We can do it. Jesus Christ says, you have the faith of the size of a mustard grain. You could say, for this mountain to go from here to there, and it will go. But he can't help me with a school. I just get too nervous. Doesn't that sound silly? Jehovah's like, no, my Holy Spirit, I, I'll catch it. You'll be fine. No, you can't help me, Jehovah. It's like, I'm way too nervous for even your Holy Spirit to help me. Like, there's like no way you could help me. I'm so bad, you couldn't help me. I mean, does that sound silly? Joel was like, I can help you. <laughs> oh, I guess he's right on target. I've got to get out of this thing. 
How the mouth of babes. You know? uh, yeah, so Jehovah, so here's the thing. Uh, would you rather be a glib speaker where you just naturally like to just get up, you know, just go on the platform and talk? Or would you like to be somebody that has a problem giving talks because of the crowd and fear? Who's better off? Which person's better off? The one with the fear. You know why? Because the one with the fear has to tap into Jehovah. So let me get this straight. The one with fear has Jehovah's spirit and is helping them. The other one just jumps up here and does his thing. Now who's better off? The one with Jehovah or the one doing his own thing? See the point? See, our problems, they perfect us because we tap into Jehovah's spirit. And then we're, we're unstoppable. I have fear of the ministry. Well, guess what? You're in a great position. But I have a fear. Well, then you're, guess what you're going to have to do? You're going to have to tap into Jehovah and he'll carry you. So you're actually better off than I am. No, you don't understand. I'm, no, it's perfect because he'll really help you then. So you could be doing it on your own or you could have Jehovah. Are you better off rich or poor? You're better off poor. You know why? Because you've got to count on Jehovah for your next meal. If you're rich, you provide it for yourself. Are you better off providing for yourself? Or are you better off having Jehovah provide for you? Who's better off? You see, you see how it can perfect us by trusting in Jehovah and building that relationship and just trust no matter what fears we have we can trust in Jehovah all things are possible with God but not me all things are possible with God so what is the difference between an obstacle and an opportunity it's our attitude toward it every opportunity has a difficulty and every difficulty has an opportunity Jehovah's at work in our lives and we don't recognize it, or even if we don't understand it. And it's much easier and it's much more profitable when we cooperate with Jehovah. So instead of lamenting and complaining, let's view our problems as stepping stones and not stumbling blocks. Let's view them as Jehovah does. A series of problem-solving opportunities.